my name is Zach Dunn. That's who I am. I'm the Senior Director of Platform Operations at a company called Optoro. That's a very long way of saying I care about blinky lights and I care about them uh, staying blinky or solid or maybe not going amber. There's a lot of different things I care about. Mostly what I care about are blinky lights. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you today is about our transition from two separate code repos and three different ways of doing CI to a consolidated platform on, on GitLab uh, using uh, one consistent build pattern for our runners. So that being said, oops, I'm going to close your little thing so I can see my timer, which isn't started, so I get unlimited time. <laughs> so in 2012, what we did was go ahead and uh, start putting our code in this place called uh, GitHub. I don't know. It was a thing. People did it for a while. So uh, this was good, though, right? Like, people started checking in code. We started getting along. Uh, someone then had the genius idea that maybe we should actually test our code. And I guarantee you, uh, probably most people can relate, the first way this was done was on someone's laptop in a screen sh session. Their goddamn laptop, OK? So people couldn't test their code unless someone pulled it down, ran it, and then push back up the results. It was amazing. So they said, well, that's bullshit. We shouldn't do that. We'll start an artisanal AWS server, uh, some random EC2, I think it was like a boot to 1204 image, uh, and start it and run it on a screen shell there. So at least then we could have a webhook that would th and get you that pretty little checkbox. Um, this configuration was awful. Uh, it basically made it so that we were always, uh, well, we were always broken, <laughs> right? And no one trusted CI because it was slow, uh, it didn't work that well. Uh, we ended up, uh, eventually, uh, we had to reprovision this and we made it a little better by, by building it with Chef, but it didn't really work all that well. Uh, mostly because at any given point, someone could go into the UI and change all the things about it. It was, it was great. Uh, so then, I show up about 2015 in this, in this story. What, what happens is I say, hey, maybe we should do the same thing. Infrastructure is code, we should test our code, let's write some tests. So we start writing tests, and again, it's a shift uh, uh, pipeline, so it's a little better. Things were controlled. We still manage to break it all the time, because again, it's XML and a GUI, and people can go and press buttons, and if you give them a button, they're going to press it. Um, <laughs> and so, and we actually were starting to use this for CI and CD. So with CD, we had Jenkins was the only actually authorized user against our Chef server. So if you uploaded a cookbook, it had to go through a process, and we pushed that all the way to server. Like, we're, we were doing things, right? They were even right. Um, it was pretty good. So, so this is kind of the state of the world. Um, you know, we probably this way till about, I don't know, I think it was 2017, uh, 18, I want to say. Um, I made up that number. I wasn't sure what it was. Uh, mostly because we got rid of it. So we were super happy, though, with uh, how we could do CD in this environment. So we started using Terraform a lot. And when we were using Terraform, it was basically like, plan looks good. Go ahead and deploy it, Bob. <laughs> and then everyone, literally one of my engineers uh, had te uh, Terraform plan. I'm not sure. Is that everyone used Terraform? Have used Terraform? So Terraform, uh, infrastructure as code, all that. Uh, the bash alias in his uh, uh, for Terraform plan was uh, fuck me, and then uh, the uh, apply Terraform apply was fuck you, uh, because that's basically how we broke our infrastructure several times. Uh, when it would just be like, oh, I'm going to deploy some new redises. Cool, yeah, plan looks good. Let me go ahead and hit apply. What do you mean you did something to the state while I was doing something? No, 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 no. Control Z. Control yeah, that's a fun postmortem. Uh, so we're like, hey, these pipeline things, they sound cool. Let's do that. We also had some interesting problems around GitHub would, uh, had some interesting pricing models, and so we had ended up having multiple organizations so that we could have different pricing tiers based on like users and like either unlimited repos or unlimited users, and so we were trying to be cheap here. So we ended up running this on-prem, started using the GitLab pipelines, and it actually worked pretty damn well. Uh, all of, so we started adding infrastructure here. Our CI, CD, all the infrastructure code started going there. The stuff worked well enough. We actually spent the time and <laughs> wrote a piece of software called Git Glue, um, which is great. It was a little, little app. It sat there. It took a webhook from, uh, from, Git, uh, from GitHub, and it would run CI, uh, CI in GitLab CI. So now what happens is we've got three different places your code could be tested. Never co any confusion on that. Uh, also, some of them had both Jenkins and, and uh, GitLab CI. And uh, we had two different places where you could have your code as well. And then we had this glue bit in here, uh, which was fun because it was just kind of like magic that no one actually quite understood. 
it was hilarious when GitLab released a product that did what this did because we were getting ready to release this. Uh, we thought we were so fucking clever. Uh, and then, yeah. So we, what ended up happening though is now we even get some developers using this for CI because they're like, yeah, Jenkins sucks. I hate this. So all of our services, because we were like, hey, we're going to write a bunch of microservices, uh, and we can have a whole long conversation about what the hell a microservice is, uh, because I guarantee you, once you put a database into it, screw you. <laughs> so now we have uh, a bunch of services. We have about, I want to say about 50 services or so. Uh, we got those sort of spread out everywhere. We even had a couple, uh, in the, uh, a couple I call them feature devs, uh, putting code into uh, GitLab CI. So, so things worked, right? Like you could check your code in, it would run tests, and most of the time it would tell you whether or not they wor it worked. I say most of the time, because again, I think at this point we probably had about 18 or 24 Jenkins executors, which were like eight core machines with 32 gigs of RAM or that were occasionally crafted as well. So missing on that, that previous slide uh, is all of the crap associated with the executors and runners. So you've got to imagine also like a big smattering of other crap kind of around the edges. Turns out it's hard to find an emoji that would let me spread it around the sides. So things did work, right? Um, and that, that's good, right? So we decided to go up. And I put an asterisk here because when I say we, I mean a customer told us we had to get a SOC 2. Um, and I'm not sure if anyone knows what a SOC 2 is. It's, a, it's a, like a process and security thing. So basically, you're going to hire an auditor. They're going to come and they're going to audit all your processes and you have to show them a bunch of details and it sucks and you have to pay them for the privilege. So, going back again, all of that, those are all logical access groups that have to be audited. And turns out, if you want to get SSO on GitHub, they want you to pay for the Enterprise Edition, which basically just gets you SSO. So, um, things worked. We decided to grow up, because a customer told us we had to, which is a good way to do it. So how did we do that? So, Obviously, long story short, we, we, we did it. So just I'm gonna take the suspense out of the room right now. So first, we started le uh, leveraging the GitLab mirror, right? We said, we're gonna go in, uh, we're gonna chuck, uh, chuck a, a token in there, and we synced all those organizations into GitLab, right? So now we have all of our repos mirrored over there. So any changes that are getting made here, we're gonna getting over on GitLab as well. This also let us start to work out some of the permissions models we wanted to use, we could start sending people there. We could start using the uh, CI off of the GitLab, uh, hosted GitLab, Cloud GitLab, what are we supposed to call it, do we know? Because hosted is like, I sound, sounds like I'm hosting it. GitLab.com. Dot, dot com? Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so we started leveraging GitLab mirrors, that worked. Uh, second, we started consolidating all the CI. Like I said, we actually had a lot of CI, GitLab CI files in our GitHub repos, which confused the hell out of everyone. It was great. So we actually started running CI almost immediately in GitLab CI using our Kubernetes stack. So we actually m also migrated to our Kubernetes, the Kubernetes executors. Th and then the last step was honestly shot the damn repos in the head. We would archive them on GitHub and tell the team by team, this is your list of repos. They're all mirrored. Do you have your permission set? Here's a checklist. Go through it. You done? Great. All of those are getting archived. So a thing I don't have on the slides here that's, that's really fun is um, it turns out we broke a lot of shit doing that. <laughs> there are so many places in your code base that you don't even realize that are right now referencing uh, things by Git, by Git repo that are going to absolutely screw you. It's amazing. Uh, and, and the best part is everyone would say the same thing. Someone broke CI, and you'd be like, what the hell, how did we break CI? No one's touched CI today. And then all of a sudden you'd be like, yeah, Brad fucking closed down that repo today. Yes, you got, and, and the same reaction was every time we had the same reaction. Screw it, just, just get it over, change the, change the goddamn thing. So the other thing is we did this in about three months. We set ourselves a date of June, uh, it was June 1st. Uh, we started about in March, and we basically just went through this process. It was about 1,000 repos. Um, I want to say this took us a th about a thousand repos. We, we have run about 45, in that three months, because I've got the little charts now, in the three months we've done about 4,500 pipelines. Each one of our pipelines does something awful like, uh, you know, 16 different uh, jobs, which are pods, and then the pods inside of them have multiple dockers. Um, again, I have a whole other talk about testing Ruby code uh, and how we need to grow the fuck up. So uh, where we ended up? 
We have a host of GitLab. We're using uh, Kubernetes runners. We've got the um, clean room builds, which is great because this is one of the big, big, big victories here is the template, a templated set of, of consistent best practices. Because before in the Jenkins world, we were just like, go and set up your CI job. Oh, you're just doing nothing. You're not doing security testing. You're not doing, you're, not bu you're building a Docker. How? Whatever, don't care. Now I can just say, did you include the repo? Did you include the template? Good. Move on. You should have a nice little mustache. I call them CI mustaches. I think they're, I think they're cuter that way. Um, we have Canico Docker builds. There's only one single source of truth now. And I got the joy of turning off about a terabyte of crap. It was beautiful. And we had a party. <laughs> Time. <laughs>